Hey, Kurt, another week, another PBT extra. How, how are you doing? How was, uh, I know you've been very busy. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just that time of year where there's just not a lot of, my, my life isn't loaded with free time. So uh, trying to spend what little of I do get with my family and hung out a little this weekend, but uh, between games every day, at least up until now, uh, the last week and uh, draft prep, it's just, that's, I know how this time of year goes. I'm good with it. What about you? What have you been up to? You have got, I'm living vicariously through you. So tell me you've been doing something interesting. Uh, uh, well, I've been holed up in my apartment here in Queens reading poetry. Um, so vicariously living, I don't know if this is exciting to you, <laughs> but I got this book back in um, college. It was my, um, my poetry class textbook. And I was like, that was a really good book. So I revisited it and I've been starting with old English poetry and I uh, am now currently, let's see, I'm currently in uh, middle, middle English poetry. So um, yeah, I'm reading about, like there's this one poem I could read, it's very short. It's, it's from Canute at Ellie. You know, it says, sweetly sang the monks in Ellie when King Canute rode by Roman near the land and let us hear the song of the monks. So that poem has been around for thousands of years, just in case you're wondering. I've, all, look, I'm a, I'm actually a fan of poetry, but like, I'll be honest, the Middle English stuff, just pretty much anything out of Middle English, I've, I just, I've struggled with all of it. It's a different language. It's a different language. That's yeah. why it's just fun for me to like, because it's like, it looks a lot like German. I mean, yeah. you know, it's English is a Germanic language. And then you could see how like the French influence came after that was the, the language of the world. But there was, I mean, the old English, it looks very much, and I mean, it, like a foreign language. Yeah. And, and reads that way. So. so, anyways, that's what I've been up to. I've been I've been reading. Uh... I, actually, I'll, I'll take it. It's still better. It's still better than draft prep some days. So, I'll take it. <laughs> unless you're in Middle English, then I'll stick with draft prep. Yeah, you know, it, it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, we'll, we'll we'll split it up. So now the WNBA is back in full swing. Yeah. Some big names, Kurt. Some big names. Brittany Griner back, and um, the home debut. It's, it's interesting, kind of seeing the the reception. You know, this whole this whole season. You know, Brittany Griner is. You know, she's one of the most bubbly personalities. But you have to think. You know, just reading some of the articles and stuff. The emotional toll it might be. Like every single game. Like there yeah. was poetry. There was dance. There. Was so, I mean, yeah. the welcome back has been. Uh, you know, it's so wonderful for her. Uh, how do you think she'll be able to handle it emotionally throughout the entire course of the season? I, I'm curious how that goes. And like, if it fades a little bit as it goes, but the, the I, it's gotta be heartwarming. I, I, it's hard for me to, I can't imagine what it's like to be her and have been through that. Um, but it, the heartwarming response of, of seeing how many people cared about you and were thinking about you has to, I would think have to buoy your spirits a little and feel good. And, and by the way, I think she went out in the first game and dropped 18 and nine and the excitement, I think it's, you know, we talk about Brianna Stewart dropping 45 and all this stuff. But I will tell you, I'm at one of the Lakers Nuggets games in L.A. In fact, game three, right? Because that was the first one right after the season started for WNBA, for, after Briner's, Griner's first game. Both in the locker room with some of the Laker players, you know, on this, like, around media members. We're talking about the WNBA season. Like, there, there is a real buzz about the league this year. I, I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah, the, the, the big news, especially before the season got started, the penalty on Becky Hammond, how she was suspended. Yeah. And um, and then there was a, a, a draft pick taken away as well from, from the Aces. But you look at that super team, the Aces versus the super team Liberty. Yeah. You mentioned it, Brianna Stewart drops 45 franchise record in her home debut. It, it, so there are a lot of storylines going around generally. And we have and we just we just tipped off. I feel like there is more momentum this year than ever before. I think the other thing that's fun is, is that, you know, I was watching the, one of the Sun games the other day. It's like the depth of talent right now in the league because there's good players really coming through and there's this wealth of talent. And it's it's kind of – I think the talent level has outstripped the growth of the league in the sense that there's not as many franchises yet. So each team – like – the quote unquote, you know, hey, oh, they're not the super team. They're they might not win. They're good. Like there's yeah. just real talent everywhere right now. Yeah, I, I mean, remember that Chicago team is just like, are they gonna? They're 500. They end up winning the championship, yeah. and then yeah, so the, you're right. There there is a kind of a feeling that like anything, anyone can get upset at any time. Yeah, um, a little bit. Which, which is yeah. And then you know, it's funny too, though, with the WNBA. I feel like with so with sports, I think you can kind of tell. Um, like the momentum as far as like how they captured the consciousness of the nation. If you're talking about in the off season, right? 
And and there's this there is definitely I feel like we're getting to that point with the WNBA where we're not at a, at a full year news cycle yet, but no. I do feel like we're getting closer to hey you know it, we're, we're, people are generally following Sabrina Nescu you know oh she's yeah. cited here or you know like what are they doing in their off season like what's happening our teams like what what is happening as far as the makeup you know who's coaching where we're not there yet but I do feel do you feel that same momentum that I I'm starting to hear more about it in yeah. the other parts of the year. Yeah, because if you if you're excited about the league and you're excited about the team, then and it's this look, it's the it's what drives the NFL, what drives I think the NBA may be best at it, but NHL doesn't MLB. You care about how that team is made up. You care about who's there and and who's moving around and where these teams are. And and so yeah, there's there was excitement about the free about free agency and the draft and the draft which had you know look. The top of those drafts are loaded with people who are going to make impacts in the NBA the next year, or so I, or the WNBA the next year. Or so I, that's exciting. I'll tell you the other thing I found interesting was the number of um, people I've got in my Twitter timeline talking about like how they're going to bet the WNBA games and and talking mm-hmm. about it in in the way you would. They're talking about the you know, hey, Heat Celtics game five. Here's your play. The, the, you're seeing that with the NBA, which I think again speaks to the level of fan interest and in people watching the game. That that there's this desire to to put a little money on it, which is I think just a sign of fan interest in general. Lots to keep an eye on there for the WNBA season as we we follow that, and of course in the NBA, yeah. Nuggets sweep. It happened. Yeah, in short order. I was in the what building. What was your reaction? You were there. You're, you're in LA. What was your reaction? Yeah. I think in person, what really stood out about the Nuggets you know, versus the Lakers in particular, and I've seen the Nuggets a couple times this season, but what really stood out to in the series is just the continuity was and the the depth. Uh, but not, and neither team, look, you're this deep in the playoffs. You're, you're running eight men out there, but you're really running six, maybe seven man rotations. You, you, there's not many, you're not going deep with guys you can trust now, but the nuggets of all the the continuity of their ability to play together and just know where each other is going to be. And the, the seamlessness of how they flow defensively and offensively and, and their ball movement and player movement is just at a different level than the Lakers who essentially came together at the trade deadline. And the, and the Lakers talked about it after they're like, we, they, they were just, the, the continuity was really evident in person that they were just smoother. And it's not just, it's, it's not just how good Jokic is or how great Jamal Murray was in the series. It's that learning to play off of Jokic, Corey would be different than just about, it's very different than like playing with Joel Embiid or somebody and the guys there have figured out how to do it. It's this is the point that I think is, is critical in the NBA is on the trade deadline. I think the teams that do the best are the ones who get support pieces. Yeah. Derek White, remember, with Boston. Yeah. Now we see Rui Hachimura with the with the Lakers, yeah. right? Like the teams that can add a, a nice uh, – to fill out the roster, you already have Anthony Davis and LeBron. That can take you from a middling team, you know, playing <laughs> to Western yeah. Conference Finals, right? But it definitely can't make you a championship contender. And, and I think that's kind of what we're learning about this Lakers team is, for me, it exposed the Western Conference – uh, as far as okay, well, the first round, Grizzlies and Kings, they kind of they kind of um, spilled the milk. <laughs> you know, it's like they kind of like it's kind of like wait, what happened? And it and it, I think in my mind inflated the 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 value, if you will, of the teams being Warriors and Lakers, where people were like, oh, both these teams are great. Then the post mortem comes out, and the Lakers can't compete with the Nuggets; they're on a different no. plane. And then the Warriors, you know, even Steve Kerr comes out and says, hey. This is not a championship team, right? So I, I think in that sense, we were a little um, de- deceived uh, in this Western Conference playoff run so far. That's an interesting theory. And I think, the, the Corey, we talked about this a little before, but in previous podcasts and, and videos where we're like, are we just sleeping on the Nuggets? I, ultimately, I think... <laughs> that, could, that also could be very <laughs> succinctly. Yeah. It's just very, like, we <laughs> we were like... there the Lakers were drama and, and Russell Westbrook being traded. Right. And, and, and reworking Andrew that Russell team back. and, and the Warriors were, you know, back to training camp. And we're talking about how the punch influenced Draymond's punch, of you know, uh, Jordan Poole and how that impacted the team, even through the playoffs and they never got their footing. And 
John Morant and everything with John Morant, all this drama and the Nuggets were like, yeah, we're pretty low key. We're just yeah. and then the triple beam. Remember, like with the, with the Sacramento oh, yeah. first time in over whatever eighteen years. Yeah, and the, right. And the Suns and the right and the Suns make a big with move. So we're talking about yeah. all this other stuff. And the Nuggets were like, I will say this: I was really impressed. A, this is when you're around them a little bit. You, you're clearly a team that likes each other. They're comfortable with each other. There's um, a, a camaraderie in that locker room, uh, and you could see it. Man, I'm watching them warm up before game four. And I'm like, I don't know if, you know, are they going to come out? How are they going to come out? Do they care? It was hysterical. They're, they, you know, they're, they're DeAndre Jordan's going over tape with a coach, like on a laptop sideline while guys are kind of warming up. And if a guy went in and threw down a dunk or hit a big shot, be, woo, yeah. And he's yelling at him. And the best, Jokic is warming up. And he, every team has to have one assistant coach who's like, an assistant coach or, or training staff guy who's like six eight to six ten minimum, yeah, so yeah. that you can body up your big guy and, and play around. But that guy has to step away and help with something. So this poor uh, training staff guy who's like I don't know six three is got to help Jokic on his last couple post ups, like he's playing the fake defense, <laughs> and Jokic on the last one just backs the guy down, dunks over him, and then gives him the too small. And, oh, my God. <laughs> and you're like, they're just having fun and they were loose. And I'm like, they're going to win this game. They're just not, yeah. they're just, they're just in. They're them. playing like they have nothing to lose. Yeah. And, and they really don't. It's the first time in franchise history that they made it to the finals. You know, Jokic wins the, the Western Conference MVP award. It, it seems like this team realized, and they didn't have the, I think also the pressure of being the MVP, you know, like Jokic being a yeah. three time back to back to back MVP. Because there is that moment where you get that award, right? The MVP award during the, the, the conference, sorry, during the um, during the playoff series. And then you know how it is in the playoffs where in a seven game series, they'll use any, any, yeah. any bit of like perceived slide or motivation. Everything's motivation. It's like that award ceremony. Oh, I wanted to beat them. You know, I wanted to prove that I was the, MVP, whatever, yeah. you know, so I don't think the, the Nuggets had to deal with any of that. No. And they, Jamal Murray was fantastic. But again, I think what really stands out is just like Jamal Murray kind of has a flat period in what a game is. All right. KCP is going to step up for five minutes and knock yeah. down shots and make plays. And their, their role players are Bruce Brown was fantastic. Like their role guys are stepping up and there was, there was a different level, which is, I think led to the, I, I wanted to talk. I'm glad we did this. I really wanted to talk about the Nuggets first and how good they are and how they have a whoever comes out of the East and and we'll you know we're more than a week away from the final starting but whoever comes out of the East the Nuggets have to be if not the favorite like yeah. you've got to have them right there right for sure um, I wanted to talk about how good they were before we got to the Lakers and LeBron who just has the ability to I'm going to steal the headlines after this game. Uh, I know it's, it's pretty amazing how that happened, yeah. actually. Yeah, and I was in the room for it when it happened, and well, but, but you know, let's, let's, for those who don't know, oh, when yeah. LeBron said, you know, he openly questioned, "Should I retire?" But that's what you're just yeah. Saying. It, he didn't use that word, but do I want to continue? Um, and and I think that there were a lot of factors that went into him saying that. Uh, look, he was exhausted. He had literally played all but 40 seconds of the first half. And by the way, I think the reason he didn't play those last 40 seconds was to avoid the halftime interview. He literally mm. basically checked himself out of the game with 40 seconds to go, went straight to the locker room so he didn't have to do any halftime interview, you know, like the, the walk-off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I genuinely think that that was the motivation. Um, he was tired. He was frustrated after losing four straight. Remember Carmelo Anthony, we'll talk more about him in a bit. Carmelo Anthony retired that morning. That is one of LeBron's closest friends. Mm -hmm. That is a buddy of his. So all that's on his mind, but I still and the last shot. Don't forget the last shot. I mean, the they had a real shot. shot. It yeah. came down to the last four seconds. He had the ball in his hands, and you know, and he's yeah. very comfortable and almost put up a 40-point triple double. It's not like he didn't have a great oh, game. It was amazing. And at 31 point first half, he carried them. The Nuggets, I, I honestly, when you were watching him, he came out ready to I'm we're extending this thing. I want to go. I want to play another day. Let's go back to Denver. And there were teammates who seemed did they have maybe they have reservations in Cancun already? Like they already seemed half there. Like they were the, the motivation was the same, and he kind of dragged them into that game. And all that said, I still think it's a leverage play. 
it just it read to me in the moment like this was he like he used to use those one year contracts right in Cleveland where he's like I'm gonna keep I think this was hey Rob Polinka we weren't good enough I just played 48 minutes and dropped 40 and we weren't good enough you got to go get me some help you got to get me some real help um, and I don't think he's totally wrong by the way. You know, I, I, I mean, clearly, like I said, that yeah, for the, yeah. the Lakers, I don't think I, I think this is what I'm saying is the perception yeah. of like, oh, they're such a great team because they beat the Grizzlies. But we talked about this, you know, John Morant, his suspension going late in the season, totally derailed yes, the, the momentum. And then that Grizzlies team, when they actually came back together, they I mean, they did not seem like the same Grizzlies team, did they? No, no, they I didn't. Mean, so- they seemed off. Uh, they got um, and you, you, I love your punk rock analogy with them. They got a little in over a, a little too punky, a little too, a little too up on the attitude, and not enough on executing. And yeah, and then and then the second series, you know, then so then the, I think most people were on cloud nine. That's like wow, like they just beat the number two seed. What's going on here? LeBron's come back from his injury, and then the Warriors, you know, they were frail and fragile all season long. I mean, their road record was terrible. I mean, consistently they never fixed that issue. So so my point is that when they actually got to this point, I think there was this um, like a, like the dot com bubble or the, you know, like the same type of idea. It was a bubble bursting. And I think for a guy like LeBron, who, you know, early in his career, he could single handedly almost oh, you know, take he did. Yes. the finals. Right. And then now in the year 20, he almost single handedly again took a team to the final. But, you know, like a 40 point triple double performance, you know, 40, 10 and nine was not enough this time, right? He still got swept and wasn't able to do it. Yeah. So I do think that the, 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 the word raw, I think, is true. Like, that moment was probably yeah. a mortality moment. Like, hey, Carmelo just retired. I can't do what I used to be able to do 20 years ago at will. This team isn't good enough. I mean, how many more shots do I really have? Well, I think that now, that's that the other said, part. Yeah, he, he knows. Yeah. He knows he's at the end. But what, yeah. But what I think, you know – Remember, he, he has mentioned, LeBron has mentioned, hey, you know, Tom Brady kind of won, he retired, then unretired. And yeah. then two, the, you know, Tom Brady's playing in his 40s. And LeBron's been very clear that he wants to play with his son, yeah. uh, who's going to USC. So I, I do think you're right. This is a leverage play in my mind. And it's not, you know, completely out of the question, I think, you know, for someone like LeBron to retire and then unretire when yeah. his son goes to the NBA on a two-year deal. He's already playing on two-year deals. Unretire, sign a one-year, two-year deal, and play in his early forties. I, I mean, I think I could see that as a completely logical. You yeah. know, if he ends up actually retiring, I could totally see him unretiring and doing a one-year deal and playing with his son and still putting up like you know twenty-something points. Yeah, I, that's not out of the question. I still think he plays next year again. His son's playing literally a mile and a half down Figueroa Avenue at the Galen yeah. Center. It's 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 it, I, one of my routes home from. I almost called it the old name. The crypto.com arena um, mm-hmm. back to the, back to the freeway to get home. I literally drive past the Galen Center like it's right there uh, where USC plays. So um, I, I think he's back. But I think his point was valid that look what we look what I had to do. Look what I and Anthony Davis had to do in these playoffs to get us here. We can't do that for 82. Yeah, like, yeah, we can awesome. give you I can give you a 31 point half. But there was nobody else to carry it. The, you know, the rest of the way. Um, I'm curious who that is. I, I, I'm just going to say this because I know it was, it was kind of hard to miss the imagery with Kyrie Irving sitting courtside. I, I've heard that that's like, that's the Lakers aren't going there. Um, even if LeBron would like it, um, they got to, they want to bring back Austin Reeves. They want to bring back Rui Hachimura, which basically makes that financially impossible. Um, the Lakers have done the, let's gut our depth to get a third star thing hit with Russell Westbrook. Um, they've still got the scars from that one. They're, they're not going down that road again. And even if they did, they couldn't match the money um, Dallas can give him. So don't expect Kyrie. It's a fun rumor, but I, I Kyrie Irving isn't happening, but I think that they are looking for and willing to make some bold moves. They've got, I think they just have to get more shot creation on the roster. So, yeah. So let's move on to uh, Miami, Boston, Boston forced a game five. I, I mean, words that I thought I would never, ever, ever say. <laughs> but Boston had to force a game five <laughs> to avoid being swept by Miami. Okay. But it's true. Miami looking to make the second final appearance in four years. Uh, and that, that game four, I, I'm curious. Halftime, 
Miami up by six. Third quarter, Boston has a big third quarter. Big 18-0 run to start the quarter, yeah. Yeah, so you know they're a second-half team. We know they're a second-half of the series team. <laughs> Do you think they can come back and win this series in seven? No. No, I don't. Yeah, what's um, your expectation for this series then? I, I don't – yeah, I – it's, it just comes down to consistency, doesn't it? Um, I, I, you know, game four, the second half of game four in particular, I, you know, my lead from the three takeaways was simply, where have these Celtics been? Like, <laughs> like they just they haven't been there for three and a half games. They show up like, look at the ball movement and the defense and the running off makes and Jason Tatum taking over in the fourth and busting the zone and doing, like, just like, where, all right, see, it's, I think that's isn't that the most frustrating thing about this team, Corey, is that there are stretches where you're like, that's the best team in the NBA. But yeah, hold on. Let me I just Google Jason back. Tatum's age. He's 25. Yeah. So, and so I think that's and I and I've said this before, and I and I and I really do think this is the case, right? We go as you know, our leader goes. That's the thing in sports, in professional sports, especially in basketball. The reality is how many consistent 25 year olds do you know, period? Yeah. Like think about your kids, think about your friends. I mean, think about like your neighbors, think about any of your coworkers, anyone who's 25 years old. It, if you're gonna be a franchise like pillar, uh, the reality is well, yes, talent has to be there, but so does stability. And I just don't think that, you know, Jason Tatum at 25 years old can be like, you know, every single night, I'm gonna give you exactly the same thing. You know, it's just, I think it's kind of like, it, unrealistic to expect that from a 25 year old and thus we see the celtics be great at moments and be you know okay at other moments yeah i think that's fair although he's he's and that team have a lot more the core of it anyway have a lot more playoff experience than most 25 year olds i mean multiple no, true, finals, true. And NBA finals like they, they've been down the true. road but that is truly the mark if you want to be Le, well lebron james is a like historically career wise yeah. and a, maybe an unreasonable so, bar, but if you want to be, if he wants to be an MVP, if he wants to be Joel, Joel Embiid this year, Nikola Jokic, Steph Curry, name your Giannis. You know what Giannis does? Brings every it night. every night. Every and that's, night. I, that's what's frustrating. And that's why it's when I, you said, can they come back in this series? And my gut, I'm like, no, because at no point have they shown me that they can string together three more games like this. Like, yeah. I just don't, I I just don't believe like they might win game five at home maybe, but I just, in the big picture, I don't think they've got three consecutive good games in. Yeah. I think this is pretty, pretty straightforward. The heat go to the finals and play the nuggets. I do think though, this is going to be interesting to me. Joe Mazzula first season as a head coach. How yeah. would you grade this season for him? I grade lightly on first year head coaches. So I'm going to call it a C minus. Like I'm not, I'm not, I, uh, I, there's plenty of Celtics fans who have that a couple grades lower. Um, I, do you think, I well, let's put, I'll just throw it at you, Corey. Would you fire him? <laughs> so this, this is an interesting question. I, my short answer is yes, but let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. No, I think it's fair. <laughs> yeah, because it's, and, and I hate to do that first year, you know, yeah. it's so unfair, but the reality is it's a different first year because, because. He's been in the system and Boston has been, as far as coaching is concerned, it's been consistent, right? Brad Stevens, he goes into the front office and Ime, take, Ime Udoka takes over. Yes, I know Ime leaves, but then his assistant takes over. It's not like you're changing the system, right? In that, in, in, like yeah, dramatically, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. you know, and the, and the pieces for the most part have, have still been there, right? And you're still having the same result. So that kind of goes to that whole, you know, madness, the, the, the insanity thing. Like you keep doing the same action, expect, expecting a different outcome. So for me, I think it's it's time, and this is unfair to Mazula in this sense, instance, but I do think it's time yeah. to, to for a different system. Yeah, no, I I think where they got in trouble, and obviously the Adoka situation caught them off guard, very off guard, because if you remember last year, Udoka was obviously the head coach, but if you yep. watch the games, Will Hardy was standing next to him on the sidelines. Like, I don't want to say co-coaching, but in his ear about a lot of stuff. He was the guy who rightfully earned a shot in a head job, and they would never have let him leave had they known. But he goes and does a fantastic job in Utah. And the number two coach on that team was Damon Stoudemire, who decided to go back and, and take a college job. Remember, he went to, I think, mm. Georgia Tech. If I remember. Yeah. Right. So, so now you're pulling 
deeper down the line. I'm with you. Personally, as much as it would pain me, I would move on. My guess is that what they'll do is not. That's just not kind of how Brad Stevens and the, the Celtics organization tends to be more patient, even though I think they're kind of in a window and shouldn't be. Uh, my guess is that one of these head coaches who does not land another job, maybe it's Frank Vogel, uh, Stephen Silas just spent a couple years as a head coach. Um, I bet they go get a guy or two like that. Somebody to be – how many guys is Steve Kerr, Mike Brown, and Kenny Atkinson? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And guys – put an, and, and Steve Kerr doesn't really need it anymore, but put another head coach, who's guy with head coaching experience or two, next to him on the bench – to walk him through some of this. Um, Cause I just, I think it's, I, I, I don't want to, I'm not even, by the way, going to blame him for this series. Right. Because yeah, yeah. Eric Spolstra is the best coach in the NBA flat out. And yes, Spolstra's coach circles around him. Spolstra would coach circles around. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, but I do think, it, but it is concerning. You think, you know, you're okay. Well, you know, you see something once, can you make an adjustment? See you twice. Yeah. You know, so I do. I do think that you're right. This is like a. It's, it's a confluence of a couple of different things. I think you hit it. The biggest one though, the availability of great coaches. I mean, yeah. it, that's kind of like that's the thing that is the most the, the most difficult to me right now. Where I'm like, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of available coaches, and if they don't get that job, I mean, who wouldn't want to coach Jason Tatum? Yes. <laughs> like, like you know, that's, that's my thing. If that's on the table, like that team is like ready made. I will make it to the final. Like, you know, so it's a really hard thing to turn down. Or So hmm. we will see. I think we need to get back to the Lakers because I know that they are in Corey's jute box this week. And I am I am I want to see where you're going with this, Corey. Yeah, yeah. This one's this one I had to bring the blues up. You know, it's Ooh. you get swept. And I, I just had to bring in uh John Lee Hooker. So I'd like to invite John Lee Hooker into the podcast. Uh I'll never oh, get out of these blues no, alive. Live version at the Cafe Oh Go Go. Uh, this is um, this song. Have you ever heard this song? I'm not. I, I've listened to Hooker before. I am not sure if I've heard this specific song. It's it's a very it's one of those songs that it's like. I mean, there's a line he says, "Drinking black coffee and smoking cigarettes." You know, he's I'll never get all these blues alive. You know, it's 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 um it's a pretty dark place. <laughs> but the the reason why I say that for the Lakers, I mean, clearly they over they they exceeded our expectations this season that's not what i'm saying i think the thing is the lebron james question right yeah. where will he leave will he step away from the game for an extended amount of time then come back will he retire indefinitely like you know will it be one of those like like serena williams the evolution away like i don't know what i, I don't know what's going to happen right but the, the thing is it's the most important question for la and i think also the idea of kind of being held up at gunpoint by your superstar year after year after year is not exactly um, a great relationship, yeah. I think, you know, and, and I know he signs these short deals, these two year deals with options and stuff. And, but it is kind of seems like every year it's like, you know, give me what I need or else. Yeah. Cause he can do whatever he wants. Yeah. Exactly. Um, they, and so they I, are, I, I think it's he has a, two, remember he signed a two year extension, but it's really a one plus one. Um, he's on, uh, he is under contract for, I think, $46 million and change next year. Um, and he's got and a player the, option for the season after that. And he could do whatever the heck he wants. And I think that, yeah, this is – and, and, and if you're the Lakers, I think you feel like, man, we have to leverage this for the next two years. And then we'll deal with the consequences. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's what I mean is uh, you're thinking – I mean, it's kind of short-term, long-term. Yeah. But then you're thinking the window, I mean, you saw what happened this year. You give LeBron James a team in half a season, they can they can go to the Western Conference Finals. Imagine if you give him yeah. a full year. But then the, the question yeah. with the money thing is, like like you said, he's playing at such a high level, and he's like, you know, 21 year. he's going to be a 21-year NBA veteran, and the deal, like, so the amount of money you're going to have to give him and Anthony Davis completely hamstring you otherwise right so so it is kind of an interesting question for the for the lakers like well like how financially do you even begin to give lebron the weapons he needs the support he needs to do it and it doesn't make sense financially it makes sense from like a a standpoint of like selling tickets 
But like, you know, I think if you're going to allocate that much money towards him and you know that he can't single handedly, you know, be the guy who gets you there anymore. Um, I think at a certain point, you got to ask yourself like a law of diminishing returns, you know, yeah. and, and I and I so it's, it's a really interesting question, I think, um, that would make one want to smoke cigarettes and drink black coffee yeah, in a dark room it, and listen to the blues. It does. Uh, let me just draw out one general thing then we'll got to drop it and, and move on to the next one. But like in the big picture, expect a very busy trade, aggressive moves from star teams off season this year, not just the Lakers, but around the NBA, because the new CBA, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're over this second tax apron, the lead apron, it's getting called, it is draconian how they hamstring your, your roster mm -hmm. building. And so teams are kind of looking at it like, Hey, we got a year, we can make a big swing for a year. That second year, maybe we can ride the team we have, but when the bills come to, we're not gonna be able to do this for very long. So I think you're going to see a really aggressive move by teams in the short term before all the rules, every, a lot of the stuff in the CBA, even though the CBA kicks in this summer, the, the real, hard stuff isn't it is for isn't for a couple of years teams are going to try to take your clippers and whatever are going to take their swings now because they're not going to be able to in a couple of years so it's just it's just something to watch this offseason and i think the lakers fall into that and then in a couple of years when all this stuff kicks in and lebron goes gonna be a lot of johnny lee hooker and the lakers i know i mean he remember he was the only one who didn't show up for an, an exit interview yep uh everyone else did it and so i mean it's it's one of those things where i'm like Sounds like the Blues. Also, it sounds like the Blues. Boston Celtics. I want to bring in. This is one of the greatest live Blues albums ever. It's called "Live at the Regal" by BB King. It's like thirty-five minutes. So I mean, think about it. It's like two. You could watch two shows on Netflix, or you could listen to this album, and it's one of the greatest of all time. It, it is a fantastic album. One because he's roaring now. That that band is yeah. playing like everyone is just played it's incredible so as far as the level of music you know it's like it's reminiscent of like a 50 point performance by jason yeah. tatum you know it's just it's just awesome but at the end of the day it is blues music which means that someone broke up with somebody yeah. <laughs> someone you know someone is sad and someone's left alone and you know it's like at the end of the day it's a it's a really talented man sitting in a chair with a hat on uh you know playing at 2 2 a.m to people drinking whiskey and drinking black coffee in some small establishment, you know, in some you know bad part of town. Like that's that's what blues is. So I think that's what the Celtics is gonna, you know, obviously you get you made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. We are seeing some stellar parts, you know, a quarter, yeah. an 18 0 run, a, a performance by Jason Tatum, uh, a second half perhaps. But at the end of the day, it's blues music. You're gonna get you're gonna get beat by the Miami Heat, and it's gonna be another question of how good could we have been? You know, one of those, like, we're all sitting around in 10 years thinking, remember that old Boston Celtics team? When they just kept going to the Eastern Conference Finals, they had Udoka as the coach, and Missoula as the coach, and Stevens as the coach. They had, who did they have on that team? They had the future Hall of Famers. They had Tatum. They had, you know, yeah. and they still didn't win. They got so close. How did this happen? The Blues. Yeah. Actually, yeah. And By the way, that is a great choice. That is an album I have heard. I might have even had the CD back in the day. I can't remember. It's been so long since I had a CD that I don't remember. But, um, I know, same. But uh, yeah, that was a that's a great call. It's a that's a. I, there are plenty of Celtics fans singing the blues even after a game one win. And, uh, so I don't know. So now let's move on to Kurt's corner. So talking about, about Denver franchise history, first time in the NBA Finals, Nikola Jokic is as a legend. We we know that Carmelo Anthony's been out of the NBA for a while now. He officially retired after 19 seasons, 10-time All-Star, six-time All-NBA player, three-time Olympic gold medalist, yeah. ninth in all-time scoring list. You know, so he played for the Denver Nuggets at a time. Remember, there were a lot – I mean, he, so where does this stand as far as the whose jersey retires? How does that work? Yeah, because he wore he, – yeah, for people who don't know, um, Carmelo Anthony wore 15 through his Denver Nugget years. That's Nikola Jokic's number. So uh, they, they might have it in the Raptors twice with two different names under it um, someday because I, I I think they have to retire it. And to me, Carmelo is I, I don't how we, I'm curious how you remember him because to me there's two things I'm going to remember him as one of the great just bucket getters that the league mm -hmm. has ever seen. Just need a bucket. Carmelo was a great combination of physically strong, got to his spots, was hard to move, would post you up. 
that sweet, quick release. Like it was, it, those things don't usually go together. You get Steph Curry has a great release, but I'm, you know, he's not exactly playing bully ball. Uh, Mello could, Mello could do that, but it could do both equally well. But I'll tell you, you kind of professor, and I think you're going to be in the same boat with me here. The Carmelo I will most fondly remember is Olympic Mello. Yeah, easily. I think that's his greatest um, contribution to the game, right? What he did for the international on, on the international stage. Um, but I mean, as far as culturally, you know, because he did not take a team, you know, there to the promised land. But culturally, Mello, he, you know, when you get a one name, yeah. it's not even like it's not even Carmelo. It's just Mello, you know. So when you're that level of like in the cultural consciousness and and people emulate your moves that you that you like your actual like celebrations, yeah. like you know, you become, you spawn yeah. memes like Michael Jordan with his crying meme. Like there are hoodie like Mello. There are Mello memes. I think his, as far as being able to contribute to basketball consciousness, I mean, he, he has definitely got to that level, you know, culturally, just on a different, I mean, it's a short yeah. list of the NBA. He's there. Yeah, well, he, I mean, as producer Dan was telling, reminding us before, he was the first guy doing the three to the dome on threes. Um, Hoodie Mellow is a fantastic Mellow. I, I think the other question is, do you think of him as a Nick or a Nugget? That's a good question. I mean, I, I was – the Denver Nuggets, to me, the, they were interesting at the very beginning because of Mello. You know, like I remember because I was watching their games and, like, the crazy colors and Mello with the headband. You know, I, I remember, like, I used to buy, like, Denver Nuggets stuff because of him, right? Yeah. And I used to, like, want to watch games because of him. So I, I think for me, I have more of a fondness towards the beginning of that, like the, the, the Denver years, just because it's my, it reminds me of my childhood and why I even wanted to watch the team in Denver play. Yeah. Um, but I do think that as far as fame is concerned, the New York years are probably the most important chapter in his NBA career just because New York, I mean, if you win in New York, you become a legend. And if you get close to winning in New York, if you just capture that excitement, like look at Jeremy Lin, you capture the yeah. excitement in New York City and you will submit yourself in NBA like history immediately. Yeah. So I think that's uh, I think that's probably how most people remember him. Yeah, I, I'd say I kind of remember Nugget Mellow a little more, but those were some fun years with the Knicks and the Knicks have had that in, in a what has been a long dry spell in New York like that was those were some highlight years where there was real hope because on any given night, it's Carmelo, man. Yeah. And the show, the show element of like, I mean, cause you're right. I, I think one-on-one, -on -one, oh, I mean, it's and one of the, yeah, so one-on-one so -on -one in Madison Square Garden, New York. I mean, it's, so you're right. That, that to me is kind of, especially where you think street ball, like it's like born here. Right? I mean, this is yeah. like Earl of Pearl Monroe, like your Rucker Park and Dykeman, like West 4th Street. You know, so like there are so many great kind of like that's what New York is kind of made, you know, made for in that sense. So I, I think it was a perfect marriage in that sense. Um, but yeah, if it comes down to the, you know, who's his Denver legacy, Jokic to me is the greatest nugget. Right. I think it's not even a yeah. question. And I think but you look at who laid the foundation, you know, like George Gervin, incredible Hall of Famer. And he laid the foundation for so many Spurs to come, right? Yeah. And his jersey's up in the rafters, and, and he's the Iceman. He's the Iceman. So yeah. I think that's kind of how Mello might be remembered in Denver. That's fair enough. Yeah, he, uh, this is – I think we're witnessing the glory years of, of the Denver Nuggets right now. So Yeah, we're, we're here. This is it. We're in the middle of it, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to coaches. A lot of coaches Yeah, a lot of coaching talk. Applying – for jobs right now and it's very exciting we're because moving if you're a coach i mean you're a team i mean yeah. getting close the bucks narrowed down to three options tell me about it what what, what do you well, what do you hear it's becoming interesting the bucks and the suns over the last 48 hours supposedly narrowed their their search down um but high on both of those lists is nick nurse and that yeah. could lead that could lead to a really interesting um like, hey, if you really like this guy, if you're the Bucks and you decide we have to shake this up, we have to, we don't want a Budenholzer protege, which is the other option to bring in um, Kenny Atkinson would fit. I remember Kenny Atkinson was with him for four years in um, Atlanta. Like you can bring in somebody who 
changes things, but doesn't upset the Apple. You know, like we're keeping the same structure. We're just different voice and doing some things differently. Nick Nurse changes everything. Yep. If you want to go that route, you better get it because Philadelphia is interviewing him. <laughs> He's getting interviewed in, in Phoenix. He is going to land somewhere on his feet. So I'm curious if this speeds up the timeline for those two teams, if, if they really want Nick Nurse. Um, the other name that's, that's interesting is Doc Rivers is now in, uh, in the mix for both of those. Would you hire Doc to be the coach to take you over the finish line, Corey? Yes, I love Doc Rivers. Okay. Hey, he, there's a lot of fans out there right now who are like, you know Doc's fallen short a lot. Has there's a, there's a history of Doc not being able, you know, not getting his team from the 10 yard in the red zone into the end zone. There's a lot of field goals there. Um, I mean, but there are, but there, but there, there are some rings. I mean, the right. Celtic, right? So, I mean, so there is, so, so my, my, my thing is this, um, I think you have to ask yourself in what scenario, I think with this, with, with the 76ers one, you know how I feel about that organization. I, I think it's there's I think there are a lot of problems there culturally, which is why the process took so long. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's still yeah. happening. And like why they make certain decisions and why they attract certain players. I think that that's a whole issue, you know, talent everywhere, up and down the roster. But I think there's an issue with that culture. I think if you're talking about like where does Doc Rivers fit in, like where when he had success with that Celtics team, like who was on that team, right? Like I think you have some like Paul Pierce, like some like some veteran guys who like understand you know yeah. how to be Paul Pierce, how to work Durant, with, a yeah. with a man a man to Durant. a man versus you know like younger guys who um, may not respond to that kind of coaching or, or older guys who might have different types of egos that don't necessarily look at it as a man to man in that sense. So I think that Doc would be great in like a, more of an older school type of locker room, not one of these young, not one of these. And I think honestly. I, I, I would you know, say that that's actually a really that's, – that's really astute because Doc, as a coach, is very much a – and this is why I think he worked with the Clippers, even though injuries and all that prevented them from going there, was he's very much as a coach, you take care of your business. Yeah, yeah. I am trusting you as a professional and a mature adult to – I don't have to motivate you. You're going to do the workouts like I don't have to get in. I don't want to be the guy who gets in your grill. I don't want to be that. Um, and he practices less than any coach in the league. And, no, you know, this, I think most of the people listening probably know this. Be a team, especially during the season, rarely exactly. practice. They do walkthroughs, but like a practice in the sense that you and I and everybody listening thinks of a practice. Don't happen. Yeah, shoot rounds and walkthroughs. I mean, you're playing every other day. Yeah. So it's, it's a recovery league. So you're not going to go run guys into the ground anymore. You just don't. So Rivers, uh, even on that scale, Rivers is extreme. Like <laughs> Rivers like never, doesn't practice, does walkthroughs, expects a high IQ veteran team to take, I don't want to say take care of itself. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to put the game plan up, but I expect you to bring your stuff organized to the, to the show. Yeah, be a professional. Yeah. And that's not going to fit everywhere. Uh, I'm with you. Um, I'm curious. Would it fit in Phoenix? Would it fit? Well, you've got Kevin not Durant. Phoenix because Kevin Durant. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, because I, I, once again, I, I don't want to, as far as professionalism, all these guys clearly, you know, like they make a lot of money, they do their yeah. thing, and yeah. they're adults. But I do think, that, like, we're talking about trust. Yeah. And I would not trust any of those Brooklyn stars. I mean, would you, if you had an afternoon, you say, hey, take a weekend off to Kyrie Irving or Kevin Durant or James Harden. Well, they, you know what I'm saying? So, I, I, you know, so even with the, the, the Philadelphia guys, if you're like, hey, take a weekend off, like, well, that was, whatever, you did. take care of yourself, would you trust Joel Embiid or would you trust, you know, like Ben Simmons when he was there? So, my point is that I think that you can say that to Giannis. I think you could, you might be able to say that to Devin Booker. I think, I think you can say it to you know? Devin Booker. Yeah. 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 So, but I think that's why I think Giannis, the Bucks actually, in my opinion, probably would be like the only team where it's like, Oh, that's a plus. That makes a lot of sense. Drew Holiday, yeah, like for sure. You know, like Giannis, Chris Middleton, like for sure. Like that whole team, they understand. If, I think Doc would be a great fit there, he, more I mean, so than Phoenix. Doc had to give. He intentionally gave James Harden some uh, Rodman passes to Vegas during you know over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, I think if you you're right, if you give Giannis two days off, 
You stayed at home playing video games. <laughs> yeah, he's he's like really going anywhere. He's playing FIFA for two days, man. Yeah, so I think I think in that sense, that's what I mean is it's a different league. And yes, you have like 30 year olds who are making hundreds, you know, hundreds of millions yeah. of dollars, but it's a it's a it's it's more of like a rock and roll lifestyle. Like, you know, I want to live like the Rolling Stones or like Dennis Rodman yeah. did back in the days and all the like, you know, be here with these rappers and be there at those festivals and go there at those parties and drive those fast cars and go on those yachts and stuff. And I feel like uh, Doc Rivers is more like old school, like, look, you know, we're all like, you know, I trust you and i just don't think trust in the nba you can't trust very many people i mean you uh, and this once again it's sad but it's true i think in a lot of professional athletics particularly in the nba you can't just you can't trust a lot of people you have to make sure like and college football does this they 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 change the schedule last second to keep people you know like kind of unsure you can't plan and then they plan everything like 30 minute blocks for a reason because you know one night out could end up in suspensions for a lot of people yeah that's probably very true and i think it's, it's going to be an interesting way to, to – it's going to be interesting to see who may, moves first because Nurse is the – Nurse is the yeah. upset, the, the, the X's and O's guy, and somebody's going to grab him. And I think the – dom whoever grabs him, I think the dominoes then fall um, with the yeah. other – with Philadelphia, with the other top jobs. Last but not least, Mad Libs. This is how yeah. we end every show. Uh, Dan, our producer, asked, well, what was your favorite board game, board game or uh, just general game growing up? Uh, do you do you still play like the same games from your childhood? No, not the same games from my childhood. I think growing up, yeah, yeah. we weren't a real board game family per se. I I'm imagining, frankly, I can picture your family. I want to hear this because I picture your family being a board game family. <laughs> mine mine was not. Um, we did, I think my favorite was probably Life, just with the little with the little cars okay, and okay. purple and blue pegs going in there and driving around. And, yeah, yeah. Um, ooh, do I go to college or do I? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, that one, but now we don't do much. I do. We, we have friends when we get together, uh, some nights and we're hanging out at their house. I uh, will end up playing cards against humanity, um, a lot. Oh, That's yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of the one I play now. What about you? Yeah. I, I don't play games anymore. Um, but when I was a kid, I mean, there was a lot. Mario Party is probably the greatest. <laughs> I mean, Mario Party is a great game. And then, um, the other one that I really liked, you know, as far as like pure beauty. It's Candyland. Um, Candyland, the logos, like, you know, like, it's just yeah. like, I mean, I could see a Candyland hoodie would be unbelievable right now. You know, like, I feel like I, everything that in Candyland, I just want it on t-shirts and hoodies and I'd be wearing it in New York. People would be, they'd lose their minds. Yeah. So, but, but I, but Mario Party was like my favorite game. Oh, uh, that's, well, I hadn't thought of that one in a while. That's a good one. That's a good, that's a good call. I mean, yeah, I mean, when when they did the little jump rope with the fire, yes. yeah. I mean every, every every mini game was just unbelievable. Anyways, that that was it for me. So, the lot lot to follow here, lot to follow here coming up with the WNBA starting up, and then of course the playoffs and the finals right around the corner. Kurt, I'm very excited. I'm excited. Your thoughts on everything. We'll talk next week. We're going to talk finals preview. It'll be fun. <laughs>